between Monday, January 23rd and Tuesday, January 24th, 2006, Jennifer Joyce Kessie, a 24-year-old, went missing from her residence in Orlando, Florida, and has not been seen since. Jennifer, we just want you to know we love you. We're doing everything, everything we can to find you. Prior to her disappearance, Jennifer seemed to lead a fulfilling life with a supportive family, a devoted boyfriend, and a successful career. There was no apparent reason for her to abruptly abandon everything and disappear. Naturally, her concerned loved ones assumed something terrible had happened when they couldn't reach her. In today's video, we delve into the timeline, various theories, and the likely events surrounding this 17-year-old unsolved case. Before her disappearance, Jennifer had been promoted to the position of project manager at Westgate Resorts in Uwe, Florida. Additionally, she had recently acquired a condominium at the Mosaic at Millennia in Orlando. Joyce Cassie Jennifer's mother reportedly informed reporters that her daughter was genuinely happy. Jennifer's boyfriend, Rob Allen, accompanied her on a recent vacation to Sanqua. This trip held special significance as Alan lived three hours away, and they typically only spent weekends together. Meanwhile, during her absence, her brother Logan Keyes, along with friends Travis and another individual named Logan, stayed at her condominium. Travis Logan's closest companion had a past romantic involvement with Jennifer. When the men vacated a condominium, Travis inadvertently left his cell phone behind before Jennifer's return from her trip. On her first night back in Florida, Jennifer stayed at her boyfriend Rob's Fort Lauderdale residence. The next morning, January 23rd, she drove directly from Allen's place to her workplace where she had a meeting with her boss at 6 p.m. Following the meeting, she headed home, and surveillance cameras at toll booths confirmed she took her usual route back to Orlando. Upon returning home, Jennifer contacted her friend Lauren to share trip details. According to Lauren, Jennifer seemed a bit down likely due to the vacation coming to an end. Lauren also observed that the geographical distance in Jennifer's relationship was becoming more noticeable. Jennifer also made calls to her parents and her brother Logan. According to Logan Drew, her father, Jennifer conveyed that she thoroughly enjoyed the vacation and everything was absolutely fine during their conversation. Jennifer also phoned Travis to discuss his misplaced mobile phone, assuring him that she would send it the following day from her office. Our timeline commences with Jennifer's final phone call on Monday, January 23rd, 2006, at 1 p.m., marking the last known interaction with her. The conclusive call was made to her boyfriend, Rob Allen. As reported, she used her landline due to poor mobile reception in her condominium. Allen revealed that they had a disagreement during the call characterized as a common discord in relationships. Later revelations indicated that the argument revolved around the challenges of a long-distance relationship. Jennifer, lying in bed and feeling fatigued from her vacation and workday, mentioned that her door was knocked on during the call. Allen explained that she assumed it was a male neighbor upstairs and chose not to answer while they were on the phone. The timeline then extends to Tuesday, January 24, 2006, between 8 hour a.m. and 9 hour a.m. Allen, whom Jennifer typically called in the morning, attempted to reach her on his way to work, but the call went directly to voicemail. He attributed this to a meeting she had mentioned and subsequent calls proved unsuccessful as well. At 11 a.m., Jennifer's parents contacted Allen to inform him that she had not shown up for work that morning. Concerned by Jennifer's uncharacteristic absence, her employer contacted her parents, prompting them to journey from Tampa to Orlando to investigate why Jennifer was not responding to any calls. During their journey, they contacted the condominium manager, requesting that he use a spare key to access her residence. While everything inside the condo seemed to be in order, the manager reported that Jennifer's vehicle was not in her parking space by 12 p.m. At an apartment complex merely 1.2 miles from Jennifer's condominium, surveillance cameras captured an individual parking her car and walking away. 
However, the discovery of both the vehicle and the footage occurred two days later between 3 Dyatch p.m. and 3.15 p.m. between 3 Gyak p.m. and 3.15 p.m. Jennifer's parents and brother reached her apartment, where they found evidence suggesting her presence at her condo that morning. Upon this discovery, they promptly contacted the authorities. However, given Jennifer's adult status, the police initially assumed she might have voluntarily left. Between 5 and p.m. and 7 and p.m., Jennifer's photo was prominently featured on flyers distributed by her family and friends in the immediate vicinity of her condo. Concurrently, a detective was dispatched to her apartment to conduct interviews and investigations. On Thursday, January 26, 2006, at 8.10 a.m., a tenant from a nearby complex informed the authorities that Jennifer's vehicle had been parked in front of their apartment for several days after catching the news coverage. The police confirmed that the vehicle was her 2004 Chevrolet Malibu, capturing photographs and subsequently subjecting it to forensic analysis. Police reviewed surveillance footage in the vicinity and identified an unknown woman parking her car and departing, despite Jennifer's face. Not being visible in the footage, authorities did not believe the person captured was Jennifer. The unidentified individual parked waited for 32 seconds, exited the vehicle and then strolled away casually. Seven years have transpired since Jennifer's disappearance, and apart from the surveillance footage, authorities have not disclosed any evidence indicating the circumstances of the missing woman or identifying those responsible for her vanishing. The case garnered national attention and multiple hypotheses about what might have transpired have been proposed. Jennifer was not only an intelligent, kind, and responsible young woman, but also highly safety conscious, as attested by those who knew her well. She was aware of the potential dangers faced by a young woman living alone and possessed the knowledge to protect and defend herself, a trait attributed to her dedication to law and order. In her routine, Jennifer was notably vigilant about her surroundings, consistently ensuring that her vehicle and condo doors remained locked. She maintained a strict policy of not allowing strangers into her home. A prevailing theory regarding her disappearance in November 2005, just before Thanksgiving, points to construction workers who were involved in extensive renovations and construction at her condominium complex during that period. When Jennifer moved into her condo, the complex had not yet reached its maximum occupancy due to ongoing construction. Jennifer expressed her discomfort to various individuals, including her parents, about the behavior of some construction workers, who at times resided in the Vassy condos while working on site. Instances of leering, whistling, and catcalling made her uneasy. In an interview, Jennifer's father, Drew Kessie, recounted her feelings of unease. During a phone conversation with him while two painters were conducting touch-up work at her condo, Jennifer revealed that she didn't trust them. To manage her concerns, Jennifer utilized her lunch break to drive home, unlock the door, and wait while the workers performed their tasks because she adamantly refused to allow anyone inside her home. While she was absent, Drew noticed that the workers in the background did not speak English, and Jennifer attempted to communicate with them. Several years later, Drew discovered that one of those workers had been arrested and detained. During the interrogation, the man was questioned about any communication with Jennifer. It was revealed that this individual had worked at Mosaic during its renovations and at the time of her disappearance. According to Drew, the man asserted that he knew Jennifer describing her as a lovely lady. He claimed that the last time he saw her, she instructed him and his colleagues to lock up before leaving. Those familiar with Jennifer would recognize that this statement could not have been accurate. While Jennifer's boyfriend was ruled out as a suspect, it is widely known that her ex-boyfriend Matt was at a bar called Blue Martini, situated directly across from her apartment complex. When she went missing, widespread rumors circulated that Matt still harbored feelings for Jennifer and desired to revive their relationship. The Blue Martini, a popular gathering spot at the time, made Matt's presence there with friends unsurprising. 
Despite the Sessi family not suspecting him and him having alibis for that night, being at work the next day, he was never subjected to a polygraph test despite his initial agreement to take one. Another individual deemed suspicious in Jennifer's case is her co-worker who harbored romantic feelings for her. Jennifer, however, made it clear that she had a policy against dating co-workers and the co-worker being married further influenced her decision. Allegedly, he was displeased upon learning about Jennifer's vacation with her boyfriend and reportedly confronted her about it. Jennifer responded by expressing her enjoyment of her time in Sanqua and her reluctance to leave. On January 24th, the day Jennifer disappeared, the co-worker did not show up for work until noon. The reason for his tardiness remains unclear. He claimed that the only evidence was a traffic ticket he received, but this assertion has never been substantiated. The following day, while discussing Jennifer's disappearance with another co-worker named Adam, he remarked, she's likely eaten up by alligators already. Adam filed a complaint against this co-worker in 2010 after enduring harassment for providing Jennifer-related information to the FBI. The possibility of human trafficking has been raised, but many argue that Jennifer does not fit the profile of a person likely abducted for such purposes. However, while it may seem improbable, given Jennifer's known caution, it is not entirely beyond the realm of possibility. The prevailing theory about what likely happened to Jennifer Cassie is that she was abducted and killed with her body still undiscovered. The person on the security footage parking her car is believed to be the responsible party. This raises the possibility that the assailant may have ambushed her as she approached her car having observed her routine for some time. We discount the likelihood of it being someone known to her, because all acquaintances have undergone thorough investigation and scrutiny in this case. If it were a botched robbery or a more random act of violence, we find it plausible that she would have been discovered by now as the assailant would have had to adapt to the situation. Therefore, we posit that the abductor spent a significant amount of time in the neighborhood closely monitoring Jennifer. Perpetrator might have been a construction worker or... It could have been someone adept at blending in through other means. Detective Joel Wright, in the months following Jennifer's disappearance, expressed his belief that she was preparing for work. Jennifer showered, got dressed, excited her condo, locked the door behind her, and proceeded towards her car. Subsequently, I am inclined to believe she was abducted. Jennifer's family shares this belief particularly in the early morning hours. Joyce, her mother, noted water in the shower cubicle's corner and behind shampoo bottles, leading her to conclude that Jennifer showered before leaving for work. Joyce also observed makeup scattered on the counter and the T-shirt Jennifer wore to bed on the floor. Jennifer's family reported the absence of her mobile phone, briefcase, iPod keys, and purse indicating she left for work before the presumed abduction. Unfortunately, no operational surveillance cameras were present outside her condominium or in the parking lot, and there were no eyewitness accounts of her departure. If you have insights or theories about Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, we invite you to share your thoughts in the comments section below. Your engagement is crucial, and if you appreciate our content and wish to support Crime Curio, brought to you by Bad Things, feel free to express your support. Thank you for being a part of our community.